intelligence here, which is another area that I've got into, which is um, using the use of artificial intelligence in healthcare interventions. And then these they listen to these narratives, they watch these narratives, and then we basically go in six months later and ask them how they feel and um, use a range of um, tools to see how they feel and also look at, obviously I'm the health economist, so I'm interested in their use of healthcare resources, but also their health status and um, start to look at their quality adjusted life years, which is a measure of um, quantity and quantity of quality of life that we use in health economics but it's a fascinating piece of work it chimes incredibly well doesn't it with what karen sankey was telling us about in relation to working with the homeless and also if you think about the first episode in series two where jonathan was talking very much about shared decision making you know we're all different and i'm sure we haven't got time but i really wanted to ask you how difficult it must be because only tuesday was that piece in the news to say that a two-year-old no Hang on, he's younger than that. He's just received on the NHS two million pounds for a single gene therapy. And without it, he probably wouldn't have lived more than two years. And this is hoping, hoping that it could give him a life expectancy up to 40. And it's that real difficulty, isn't it, around that one-off incredible cost for that one child. If you're in that family or whatever, you're you're going to say that's money well spent, aren't you? And then you've got the, as you say, the silent majority. And that must be incredibly hard as a health economist. I suppose you have to divorce yourself from it. No, you don't divorce yourself from it. I think you do the opposite. And the reason that I stay in health economics is because, it's exactly because of that question. And I saw that come up this week and I thought, one of them is going to ask me about that. I think it was actually 1.67 million, to be precise. 1.8 million, yeah. Is it 1.8 million? These questions about whether you should spend 1.8 million on one person to give them 40 years of life versus whether you should spend the same amount of money on thousands of people to give them an improved quality of life but not increased quantity of life. This is the reason why I stay in health economics because this is at the root of how complex healthcare is. When I started working in health economics, people used to say to me, we well, don't care about the patient anymore. How can you do a PhD on the economics of intensive care? And I said, I care about the patients that aren't being treated because you've chosen to use that treatment that isn't effective or isn't safe. And I went to a leadership class once and we were all told to take something that was inf- that had influenced us as our research. And I didn't take anything. And they said, oh, Rachel, you've not brought anything with you. And I just picked up a chair and put it in the middle of the circle that we were in. These are all professors and heads of, you know, public health and very very important people and they had suits on and I put this chair empty chair in the middle of the room and I think they all thought I'd gone mad or I'd just been a bit lazy and I said this empty chair represents the patient that isn't treated because you have decided to spend the money on that other patient that's in front of you but the chair is empty because you don't know who that person is that you haven't treated and that's why you can make that decision because that's what implicit rationing is. It's that you can make the decision to say, I need to treat this person in front of me. I can see them. I can feel how awful their situation is. And it is awful. Nobody can take away that it is awful. But that money is being spent instead of spending it on that other person and you don't know who it is. And that isn't just one empty chair. That could be a thousand empty chairs. I think that's really powerful. That's really powerful stuff. It sort of chimes with some of the stuff I did early in my career. You know, you had to look at this when you were looking at nice guidance. And it was really difficult because whatever way you turned in things like medicines and therapeutics committees, they were the sort of decisions you were making. And I wish that sort of, if you like, narrative that you described was more out there because it, it does make you think. The Oral Apothecary is sponsored by Jamie Hayes Executive Coaching and OneLessPill.com. Rachel, one of the pleasures for the guests of coming on the Oral Apothecary is to give us a desert island drug. You know the score by now, listener. So Rachel, what would you like to give us as your desert island drug? So the drug that I'm going to go for is propofol. Okay, ICU, yes. So when I started an ICU pharmacist in London, my job was to reduce the drug spend on the intensive care unit because we were the most expensive intensive care unit in London. So I was told to save my wages at the drugs bill. And so, well, I did that quite quickly, to be perfectly honest. But one of the things that I came across um, was a huge use of propofol. And propofol combines my deep loathing of formulation science with my deep love 
of uh, pharmacokinetics. And propofol was an anaesthetic. It was actually associated with lots of problems with its formulation. It was formulated in something called chromophore and um, caused lots of anaphylactic reactions. The FDA banned it. And actually, it was banned for quite a long time in the US. Anyway, that was all sorted out. It is an amazing, amazing drug. It was being used completely inappropriately on our, our intensive care unit. It was a head injury referral unit. And so they would basically put people on propofol because the marketing was that it would reduce time. You had to wake people up very quickly when they had a head injury. You had to be able to wake them up and see how their Glasgow coma scale was doing. So you wanted something to wake them up very quickly. And so propofol was used in these patients to, to do that. But actually what happened was that these patients with head injuries would end up on the unit for three or four weeks. And then you didn't really need propofol, but we were spending huge amounts of money on it. So my job was to reduce the spending on propofol, which I did. We I reduced the use of propofol by 99%, which I still consider to be one of the key achievements of my career. And the interesting thing about propofol with, with my love of kinetics was that you would give it to people and they would wake up quickly unless they were overweight. And of course, this was um, a drug that was only soluble in fat and it used to sequester into adipose tissue. And so, you know, if you had somebody who was overweight on the intensive care unit, they would go to sleep and they wouldn't wake up for ages because they had huge reservoirs of propofol in their adipose tissue that was slowly leaching out. And I used to have to give pharmacokinetics um, tutorials to the anaesthetics registrars. And this was one of the things that helped me to persuade them to use less of it. So that you've got a formulation which I deeply loathe. And then you've got pharmacokinetics, which I deeply love and taught a lot at Manchester. And then my first exposure to um, health economics was ICI, who owned Propofol at that time, um, wanted to prove how cost effective it was. And they had this DOS based program that showed you how cost effective it was. So this is like 1994. And they had a van in the car park at Charing Cross Hospital. And you could sit in there and they would put in calculations and show you how much more quickly your patient would wake up. And the patient would wake up um, three minutes earlier, which was statistically significant earlier waking, but actually clinically didn't matter at all. So that was my first exposure to propofol. And then my second exposure to propofol was my first study that was funded by the NIHR and I led as a chief investigator was to look at the use of day surgery anesthesia. We did a massive randomized control trial in adults and children. And I have never been so surprised at how ready parents are to let their children be randomized into a trial with different anesthetics. Um, I think as long as they were asleep, they didn't mind. And one of the things that we noticed, one of the things that we, in our results with this trial, was that we were comparing basically propofol induction and maintenance with sort of sevoflurane induction and maintenance, really. Um, so inhalational versus intravenous um, anesthesia, which sounds really boring. But actually, what was really interesting was that propofol just came into its own in day surgery anesthesia, particularly in patients who were at a high risk of post-operative nausea and vomiting because it reduced post-operative nausea and vomiting. So it really did have an impact on these patients' ability to go home. But the other thing about it, and this is where health economics came in because we looked at patient preferences and looked at willingness to pay by patients in this study, was that the adults really didn't want to have inhalational anesthesia. And when we talked to them about their preferences in a health economics-based study, the reason they didn't want to have inhalational anesthesia to put them to sleep was because they all remember the dentist's chair when they were children with the big black mask coming over them and so none of them wanted inhalational anesthesia to put them to sleep so they all liked propofol to help them put them to sleep in the children's study the children didn't have don't remember the black mask and actually children don't like injections so they didn't like propofol they wanted the mask and the mask now smells of strawberry, it's see-through and the anaesthetists were really clever and made it into a game. So they were quite happy to count down from 10 into the mask. And so propofol for me is, keeps coming back and I actually Googled propofol and there are still people looking at the cost effectiveness of propofol in anaesthesia. And I'm sort of thinking, well, we did that in 1998. Why are you still looking at it? It's a great drug. And I've not even mentioned Michael Jackson. Oh, I was going to say that. I was going to say, of course you were. Dr. Conrad Murray, one of my favorite things about everybody should have a level of competence when prescribing and know what to prescribe and what not to prescribe. What was he trained in? Cardiology. And he was, he was prescribing an anaesthetic. 
What about a career anthem then, Rachel? I know you love your music. Yeah, I do love my music. I listened to uh, Mark Talbot's episode and I thought, oh no, he's done David Bowie. But then I thought, no, I can't. It's got to be David Bowie. Uh, David Bowie has been my musical guide since I was 13. I had 42 pictures of him on my wall at university. He was, when I was a DJ at University Radio Bath, where you're never more than a second away from music, <laughs> I, played, I played a David Bowie track on every Every single show that I did. The track that I've chosen from David Bowie is Kooks. This is a, a song that was from an album that he did back in the early 70s, uh, Hunky Dory, and it's a brilliant album anyway. But Kooks, I really think is a great album for, a uh, great anthem for me, sorry, because, and actually, if you're a father, this is a really good song about father. He wrote this song when his young son was born, and it's a brilliant song if you're going to be a, a father. And I know friends of mine that are fathers that say you know this is a really good song about fatherhood but for me it's about the fact he was saying you know we're a bit weird and we don't fit in and you can be part of our group and we'll look after you but you're gonna to have to get used to the fact that we won't fit in because you know he's basically he was talking about the perspective of somebody who was in a counterculture I mean he was so far ahead of his time you know he was talking about what they used to call gender bending in those days he was trying to struggle to figure out how to be a parent when all the examples of fatherhood around him just didn't fit with what he felt and he's basically saying we're weird we don't fit in but that's okay and I think, you know, I think for me, that's always been really important. I mean, when I was at university as a pharmacist, I liked medicinal chemistry um, and then I went into industry. But then I discovered hospital pharmacy. So I moved out of industry into hospital pharmacy, which wasn't what I was expecting to do. And then when I started the PhD in health economics, I really felt as though I'd stepped aside from the profession. And it was unusual at that point for pharmacists to do a PhD in a social science. And I always felt, like I said at the beginning of this um, interview, you know, I've always felt like I'm not a very good pharmacist. I'm not a very good health economist. So you sort of, you've got a foot in both camps. So you're quite often the only person in the room that understands everything that's going on, but you always feel like you don't really quite understand everything in enough depth. Yeah, and in my personal life, once somebody said to me, oh yeah you're the one that went all horsey moved north and got a girlfriend <laughs> yeah you know so there, there are lots of people I think that feel that they're on the margins of either their profession or society more generally and I think that this song just talks to them and every time I listen to it I feel that he understands me and I know that there are lots of people that feel like that about this song well may I say you've really understood the concept of this being a, an, an emotional tag to it and I think you've articulated that beautifully so that's Kooks by David Bowie so what about a book recommendation then for the listener on the oral apothecary for the library so this is very hard for me because I don't read non-fiction very much I'm a big fiction reader I listen to books a lot when I'm out on my walks with my dogs podcasts yeah those are the ones yeah I listen to podcasts when I'm out on walks with my dogs I'm also I prefer my writers to be dead so I do like a bit of uh, Solzhenitsyn I like a bit of Zola Camus those sorts of things so it's quite difficult for me to pick a non-fiction book mark torbert's pick that was Camus. yeah i, I read that it's a, it's a very very good book the plague i think the outsider by Camus is also quite an interesting if not quite not a very chirpy book to read anyway so i did actually then think back during my phd career as to a book that really had an impact on me and actually it's the black report so the black report was a book that i was made to read <laughs> during the first year of my phd because i didn't have a master's and I had to very, very quickly gather enough credit to have the top part of an MSc so that I was allowed to progress to a PhD in my second year of my PhD. And I had to write an, an essay or a paper on the impact of inequalities in health on, uh, on society. And I was made to read a book that was a combination of the Black Report and a subsequent book by Margaret Whitehead called The Health Divide. And the Black Report was commissioned by the Labour government in uh, 1997 to look at whether there were socioeconomic impacts on health so does being in a different social class however it's defined affect health this report wasn't 
wasn't published until after the um, Conservative government were elected in 1979. So the findings of the report were quite stark. So the NHS was introduced in 1948 and there was an expectation that um, health inequalities across the social divide had reduced. And actually what this report found was that health, however you measured it in terms of quality of life, incidence of chronic illness or death, and death as in terms of longevity or perinatal death, was massively impacted by your socioeconomic status. And if anything, this was bigger than it was back in the 60s. And it was a shock to me because I'd never read anything like this before. And this report said was quite wide ranging in terms of what it looked at. It looked at socioeconomic status. It looked at home 